You know, but late in this existing supercharger standard is our, you know, woeful infrastructure that we have here at 480 volts, three phase. So that kind of began where their advantage was at 377 volts of capability, which is, you know, grabbing a single phase of the 480, um, which is more than what J1772 is able to do with AC charging. So that was a bit of an advantage right there. But, you know, more importantly, the world is now caught on to 800 volt architectures. So I've had the experience of looking at a few of those recently. Um, some are pretty darn innovative. Um, Hyundai with their Ionic 5 has this unique boost converter that goes from that 400 volt AC infrastructure quite nicely up to 800 volts, which is their battery voltage, with an integrated boost converter they put inside a, a motor and an inverter. So that was kind of cool. You've got boxes that are dedicated to the same cause on Lucid and Porsche vehicles, optional boxes available on Porsche vehicles. You've got um, the notion of uh, 800 volts as a direct connection seemingly being the obvious way forward. But for those who can't plug into an 800 volt charger, you have 400 volt chargers and some sort of boost converter is required. So Tesla must obviously see that their future is also focused on 800 volts and now they're bringing out the capability in their charging station. So good work for them, uh, good work for everybody. Uh, it's going to keep people busy keeping these charging stations upgraded for a while. So it's going to be <laughs> a boost to the economy as well. So yeah. I don't know what your thoughts are about 800 volts versus 400. You know, last variant is, you know, GM and their Hummer, very clearly an 800 volt pack inside, but operates at 400 volts by taking the 800 volt partitioning it into two 400 volt batteries, rewiring it in parallel so you can drive down the road. But when it does encounter an 800 volt DC fast charge, it can charge directly at 800 volts. So, well, you know, what are your thoughts? Are we going to see 800 volts as a, a widespread target or is it going to be niche applications? What do you think? I think it's going to be widespread over, it's going to take a while, but I think it's going to end up being the widespread kind of standard, mainly because it's like everybody wants like the fast to fast charging and like 800 volts unlocks some additional benefits with some, these newer battery technologies coming to market that can charge in minutes. It's like we need that better infrastructure. It reduces like what is it, thinner wires, reduces the heat loss, all those kind of things. It has all these benefits that are going to be really key for EVs specifically. So it, it makes sense why we'd want to go 800 volts. Um, you, I mean, you brought up the Ionic 5. It's one of the reasons I'm actually interested in that car. I keep eyeballing that car as my next car. <laughs> for one, That's one of the reasons. Interesting about the way they did it, too. They have some patents that you can look at to describe how it's all working. But they didn't implement all the things that are shown in their patents patents. Um, they've left out some components that saved a lot of money, but introduces hmm. some minor amount of loss at 800 volt charging that I don't think anybody will ever notice. They'll just be so happy to charge at the native 800 volts. So um, yeah, yeah uh, I won't go into that here, but uh, I see it similarly. 800 volts is an inevitability. There will be lots of cases where it doesn't make sense to transition my first application at 800 volts led me to believe it was way distant future, and it was back then. Um, but mainly because of the componentry, if you go above 600 volts, it's really hard to buy parts, connectors, contactors, all the different components that go in a battery. So, um, all right, so we're common on the 800 volt yeah. future. All right, so <laughs> yeah, we're kind of in lockstep right now. <laughs> so then you get into the DC fast charging aspect of this. And you know, this is fascinating to me because, you know, for years we've known that fast charging wasn't the best thing to do to your car. Uh, yet people do it all the time. Uh, people actually use it as criteria for what would allow them to buy an electric car. If they can, you know, top off their charge similarly to the way they do their gasoline or diesel vehicle, then, you know, 
it's one less thing for them to complain about. So that being the case, you know, you've got this new report that came out in Inside EVs this week um, that talks about the, the statistical degradation, what happens on real cars. They spotlighted some Model 3s and Ys where they were either 90% fast charged um, or, you know, 10% fast charge as it was. You can read about it if you like. But what, what's your take on that? Are, are we seeing a reduction in the barrier that is, you know, focused around this DC fast charging and the degradation of batteries? Or, or will we just not care? <laughs> <laughs> I think ultimately we're just not going to care. I mean, think about like our, our phones. It's like people do wireless charging on their phones, even though it actually is a little harder on the batteries because it's more convenient and they like it. So it's like, we're going to do what we want to do. And if you want to charge your fast charge your car 90% of the time, you're going to do that. So it's for me, the fast charging issue is less of an issue over the course, the, the life of the, the vehicle. Like if you looked at those graphs in that article, it was fascinating how like the fast charging, it did go down a little faster, but then they kind of met up again <laughs> it was after almost, a certain period of time. Yeah, it's like as you get down to about 90% of your remaining capacity, suddenly it's almost as if the battery's been conditioned to fast charging, and now it's even a little exactly. better. So it didn't yeah. work exactly the same on the 3 and the Y, but it was very interesting, to say the least. Uh, but you know what it does do is it kind of points out the other uh, problems that are associated with that, um, and that is more about how low do you let it go before you charge and how high mm -hmm. do you take it when you do charge? Uh, these things I think will remain sort of uh, hidden um, advantages for those who know about them and disadvantages for those who don't. So, you know, this is um, my own study of battery cell chemistries shows that in those extremes of, of state of charge, um, particularly above 70 or below 30, you get a lot of mechanical changes that occur in the cell and it, it kind of distorts it, uh, expands when you charge, it contracts when you discharge, expands over time. So, um, you know, what, what are your thoughts about that? Are we going to continue to try to get as much range as we can out of the car or are we going to try to focus more as a, a, a middle-of-the-road state of charge? You know, maybe, maybe you can describe what you do in your own car. Do you... Uh, do you consistently discharge it all the way or do you try to keep no. it in the mid-range? <laughs> yeah, I, I understand the whole thing of like you don't want to hammer the battery all the way to zero and go all the way to 100. That's when you're going to be like really hurting the battery. So I tend to keep my car between that 30 and 70% state of charge most of the time. But I'm also in the know and I'm not the normal driver who's not going to know this. So I think the future of this really comes to software around the user experience where the car itself can try to manage the battery management system, trying to prevent the user from causing undue damage to the battery. Um, I think you see this in smartphones right now. Like with uh, an iPhone, you plug it in at night when you go to bed and you get up and you unplug it. Well, it's not charging all night. It learns when you're getting up on a typical day. And so then it will limit when it's charging. It will just trickle charge overnight and then it will do start doing the main charge in the morning right before you get up. So it's trying to manage it so that you're not going to be like hammering the battery. I think cars are going to end up doing something similar where you don't have to know that whole 30, 80% kind of range. You can just do what you do at home, plug it in and you walk inside, but it's actually only trickle charging your car. And then it will like kind of slow things down in a way to help prevent hammering the battery. I think software is going to save us here. Yeah, you know, I think that we're already seeing some benefits of that with the Inside EVs report we talked about. Um, the very fact that they've been able to make DC fast charging seemingly, you know, inconsequential to the average Tesla owner, um, to me, speaks to the software that is behind all that. You know, a lot of people go, yeah, I have 250 kilowatts of charging at my fast charger. And then they look at the data and they go, wait a minute only actually charged at that rate for like five minutes and then it started yeah. tapering off what happened there well again the software knows and uh it keeps things in check and i think that's you know a real testament to good software and mm -hmm. you know what the results of taking the extra time to get it right really turns into so good stuff you know then you get on to all right, now I have this tremendous battery on wheels. Uh, what else can I use it for, right? Um, yeah. And I know this is a subject near and dear to your heart as it is mine, although you're way ahead of me. So I will look forward to learning some things from this session. You know, 
remember reading years ago about vehicle to grid and you know now there's all the focus on vehicle to load and you know this big broad category of v to x if you will um, so some of the key issues about that are you know when we have a warranty on our cars um, the U.S. government, for example, mandates an eight-year, 100,000-mile warranty with some wiggle room for interpretation on what that means. But it's based on miles and calendar, not kilowatt hours. So wait a minute, this warranty, <laughs> who's paying for that warranty as I use it to prop up the local area grid or you know, provide energy for my home? What are your thoughts on that? You know, you've, you've looked at it a lot more deeply than I have, I believe. So I'm, I'm really interested in your view. Yeah, the, batteries changes the game in so many different ways when you're talking about a car because it has multiple uses they never had before. So we can't just look at it as, oh, it's got a 100,000 mile warranty or something on it. We have to think about it in a different way. So I do like the idea of changing warranties and doing it based on like uh, kilowatt hours in versus out or some kind of warranty around how much the battery has been hammered or used in a given time frame versus how many miles you've driven because vehicle to grid <laughs> like look at the ford f-150 like how many how big is that battery it's like it's like the equivalent of what six seven power walls something yeah. ridiculous it's yes. like you could you could power your house for an entire week off of that truck it's like i want to be able to use my Tesla Model 3's battery in an emergency situ situation of my house. Like if the power goes out, I could plug it in and power my house for days. Um, it makes so much more sense. But at the same time, the current warranties are not gonna take that into account. And when you're using batteries for vehicle to load or vehicle to grid, um, it really does hammer the batteries. It really does uh, shorten their lifespan if you do it on a frequent enough basis because it is dragging the battery down to close to zero, up to 100 if, if you're using it the way that the grid wants to use it so you have to account for that in the scenario if we have vehicle to grid um tesla is like one of the few companies that has not really addressed this they have they've never really come out and said they're going to do it and i've been curious as to why probably because they have the power wall they don't feel like they need to because they have a product that can sell that will give you this stuff at home but again one power wall it takes several power walls to make the equivalent of a model y or a model 3. so we ha already have the battery let us use it how we want to use it 